Kelsey. This is my channel, The Fancy Hat Lady Reads. I'm wearing one of my fancy booktube hats, and today I am doing a double review of two books that I had review copies of from NetGalley. These are both fantasy books, and I've paired them together here because I think they share a few other traits in common that may make them appeal to similar readers. They do both take place in secondary fantasy worlds based on the first half of the 20th century, and secondly, they do both feature queer characters and relationships. The first of these is going to be Witchmark by C.L. Polk, which was a June release from the Tor.com publishing line. It is, however, a little on the long side for me to be comfortable calling it a novella, so I'm not going to. And then the second book is going to be Armistice by Lara Elena Donnelly. This was a May release. It is the second book in the Amberlow dossier. When I include sequels in double review videos, I always put them second in the double review. I try to keep my reviews relatively spoiler-free for earlier books in the series, but depending on how much you want to know or don't, you'll have a chance to click away after the first half of the video. I should say that I gave both of these books four-star Goodreads ratings. So as I said, we're going to start with Witchmark. This is a debut with a lot to offer fantasy readers who may be looking for any number of different things in their next read. It's got a historically inspired secondary world setting in which we eventually come to learn of a very complex magic system. The plot starts out, interestingly enough, as a murder mystery, then grows to encompass the unearthing of a much larger scale conspiracy. And at its heart, it's a touching, sort of paranormal male-male romance. The setting has a bit of an Edwardian England feel, with turn-of-the-20th century technology fueled by new modern ether-based power instead of electricity. Ayland is welcoming home victorious soldiers from a war abroad, and some of them are under the care of our protagonist, who calls himself Miles Singer, having fled a previous life and identity to become a military doctor. Miles is treating his patients for troubling psychiatric symptoms while also hiding his magical healing abilities. In this world, members of the lower classes who are discovered to have magic are considered to be witches and institutionalized, since the common belief is that they all unfortunately and inevitably go mad. Amongst the upper classes, however, it's a very different story, though the secret of the nobility's mages is guarded from the public. The story kicks off when a dying man, himself a witch, arrives at Miles' hospital with knowledge of his magical power and true identity, claims to have been poisoned, and begs Miles to find his murderer. Another man, Tristan Hunter, witnesses it all and persuades Miles to assist him in solving the mystery. Mr. Hunter is mysterious, gorgeous, and not at all what he appears to be, with a mission much broader in scope than just one murder case. Together, he and Miles dive deep into the web of Aelin's intrigue, push the limits of Miles' magical understanding, and also develop a slow-burn romantic attachment. There were some aspects of this story that appealed more to my personal reading tastes than others. For example, I enjoyed that there were really high stakes without needing needing to rely on action scenes to move the plot. I am less a fan of complex magic systems that require protagonists to spend a lot of time learning about the workings of magic, although I do know that there are many fantasy readers who would disagree with me on this. And then the whole paranormal supernatural element that comes into play was just a whole lot of other stuff on top of it all, and I guess I didn't totally know what to make of that. I really did enjoy both the mystery and the romance plots a lot, but I thought that it took way too long for Miles to realize the importance of what he and he alone could tell was ailing his psychiatric patients. To me, it was pretty obvious from the beginning. I see that there is a planned sequel now to this book, and I am glad to hear it. Witchmark works as a standalone character arc, but it ends with a lot of uncertainty as to what's next for the nation of Aeland. Also, that's a whole heck of a lot of work put into a magic system for just one book. I can say I am looking forward to the next one. So next we're going to talk about Armistice. This sequel to Amberlo picks up three years after book one, and so when we encounter several of the characters from book one, it's to see that their lives are drastically altered by the intervening years of Ospie rule in Geta. 
If you'll recall, the first book chronicled the rise of a Nazi-like fascist movement in a fictional country with a 1930s flair and an urban culture deemed morally deviant by the rising regime. We watched as our beloved, messy, morally questionable characters' lives were dashed to smithereens. Remember? So the action of Armistice actually mostly takes place outside of Geta, broadening the political scope of the series. We're in Porichis, a tropical country that seems South Asian in its inspiration. It took me a while to realize that Porichis actually has a matriarchal social structure, which is both refreshing and important to at least one major aspect of the story. The cabaret angle of the first book is replaced by a film industry angle in the second, but showbiz is still showbiz, and showbiz is still central to this series. Aristide has achieved a high-profile position in his new expatriate life as a film director for a studio run by a shrewd and powerful woman named Poulan. Cordelia arrives on the scene having been smuggled out of the country by the rebel group she leads under the codename Spotlight, and seeks work as a dancer on a film that Ari is directing. The contrast between these two is pretty sharp. While Cordelia has been fighting a hard losing battle at home, Ari has been nursing his pain by turning his back on Geddon politics and losing himself in the escapism and glamour of the films that he most likes to make. Cyril's place as the major third character is taken by his sister, Lillian DePaul, whose story as an unwilling political pawn of the Ospies mirrors Cyril's from book one in some interesting ways. She's the press attaché for the Geddon Embassy in Porachis, in the ever-painful position of being a public spokesperson tasked with defending the unconscionable. It isn't the life she had in mind when she chose to dedicate herself to public service in better times. This isn't the government she thought she was signing up to work for, but now she's stuck. Her superiors have her son enrolled in an Ospie boarding school, and she's only allowed access to him if she does as she's told. And even if she could take her son and flee, what would she do? She's a woman who has sacrificed so much in her life for the sake of a career in government. It would mean throwing her whole life as she knows it away and starting again. Lillian may not be as charismatic a character as Cyril, but I actually came to sympathize with her dilemmas much more deeply. Lillian also gets to have the major romantic conflict of this book. Amberlo centered around LGBTQ plus characters, and they're very much still represented here in Aristide and others. But Lillian's secret love affair with her child's Porachine father was illicit and forbidden for different reasons. As is true with all of the relationships in this series, nothing about Lillian's love life is easy or straightforward, especially with dangerous political games in the mix, and in this case, a child at stake. Like the first book, Armistice is a complex page-turner, and I was mildly surprised to find that the plot actually turns out to be a sort of a caper. And though it fits with the caper structure, I was also somewhat surprised at how many things that could have gone horribly wrong didn't. After all, if something could go catastrophically badly in Amberlo, it probably did. It feels like Laura Elena Donnelly is pulling some of those punches here, allowing her characters to make wiser decisions and benefit from them. It may feel tamer and safer as a storytelling technique, but I am ready to welcome what seems like a bridge to what might be a more hopeful series finale. Now, because I didn't do a full review of Amberlo back when I read it, I want to take a moment here to address some of the things that I think Donnelly is doing with this series as a whole. First, it's noteworthy that this is a non-magical secondary world, and one that is based on an unconventional time period for fantasy. I've read books set in medievalish fairy tale type kingdoms, for example, that don't have magic, and no one bats an eye at calling them fantasy. So I stand by fantasy 
as the correct genre term for this series. And regardless, it's clearly exceptional speculative world building. After all, I'm always more interested in the social structures and conflict in any given fantasy world than in the magic system, so on some level it puzzles me that there aren't a ton more authors doing what Donnelly is doing. Second, I want to point out that this series focuses on characters that are several steps removed from the height of power and decision making, even if they are close enough to government workings to be in a lot of danger and to give us an inside look at the political machinery. Like in this book we have diplomats and rebels and well-connected entertainment industry folks, not towering villains or opportunely placed chosen ones. I found it fascinating in the first book to see how political disaster gradually spread out to those who assumed that they of course would be safe. And in this book, we're looking at the different ways that characters are coping with what is at this point an entrenched crisis, literally from afar. The downside of all of that is actually the greatest weakness of these books for me. It is dang hard to follow some of the major political events in this series when they are so complicated and we are viewing them from a remove. For example, the armistice of this book's title is a reference to events in a border dispute between Geta and a neighboring country. It's all very important, but it is hard to retain the critical details when none of the central characters are directly involved. I think this is a case where some extra materials like glossaries of major political figures or like a timeline of recent events might actually be a lot of help. Lastly, I want to end on a positive note. I thought in the first book, and I continue to think here, that this series would make for sizzling good television if anyone would adapt it. Like, on top of all of the character stuff and the big political ideas, like, think of the dance numbers. I want it to happen. Anyhow, that is it. That has been my double review of Witchmark and Armistice. Let me know if you've read either of these books or if you're planning to. Let me know what you think. Anyhow, I hope you are having a nice day. That is all. Bye for now. <laughs>